wow, our uh, social technologies are so slow and creaky and and you know bureaucratic and or like yeah, the the problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And so it's like, okay, can we get our medieval institutions to catch up to our godlike te technology? Maybe even by using that technology or by sort of combining what we have in new and interesting ways. Hello. Today I chat with Saffron Huang, who is part of this new set of, you know, agentic interdisciplinary tech ethics folks who are really good. And she's uh, co-founded this institute called the Collective Intelligence Project. And they are thinking in a really beautiful way about how we as a people can elicit values from ourselves in order to kind of move forward um because because we have something like democracy but it doesn't do that good of a job at like aggregating the people's input and like markets do an okay job at aggregating the people's input but none of them is are perfect and so she and her collaborators are thinking about this in a really good serious way and so we first kind of talk about saffron's perspective on how she is how she uses the collective intelligence frame to understand institutions in the world, to understand markets, to understand democracy, to understand, um, you know, voting systems, whatever they may be, using the collective intelligence frame to understand that. Second, we chat about consensus technology. And so she's excited by stuff like Polis and other versions of technology that helped us come to consensus around who's in what group and what people believe and to actually get us moving forward. And also how AI is going to be helpful for kind of representing those groups um, and kind of modeling those groups and saying, hey, this is what this, uh, this is kind of a, an LLM representation of what this crew believes and that that's kind of a, a possible juicy next step that a lot of people are excited by. Uh, third, we talk about this amazing trilemma, which thinks about the kind of super progress people, accelerationist, techno-utopianists versus the kind of safety, authoritarian, don't do anything people versus the kind of participation, participation, distribution, we already have enough, we don't need more progress people, and how that kind of map has helped her and how we can also use that map to say, hey, let's kind of elicit these values at different times in order to help us move forward as a people. And then finally, we chat about, um, you know, her, the future, like the 20 year future around institutions, and how she's excited by different forms of institutional vehicles that create the right incentives and the right kind of value elicitation for us to move forward. Uh, so I think it's a great episode. It really gets at this, you know, idea from E.O. Wilson that we have, you know, paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And this is a good dive into how we might have not medieval institutions, but kind of technologically enabled amazing institutions that are able to keep up with our godlike technology. Uh, so that's what this is all about. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Saffron. Thanks. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the co-founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe the best way to predict the future is to build it. And so I'm interviewing pioneers on the frontier to understand what the world will look like and the secrets behind how they're building it. These are insights from the frontier. And today, I'm excited to chat with Saffron Huang. Saffron was a research engineer at DeepMind and is now the co-director of the Collective Intelligence Project, this great new org that is directing technological development towards the collective good. Saffron, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you, Reese. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to dive in. And and Saffron, for listeners who don't know her, she's part of this, um, what I would call like a hip, cool, tech, you know, young tech, often women adjacent crew um, who's doing amazing, cool stuff. And so um, and, and specifically, and it's, it's great too, because now that is being manifest through this collective intelligence project. And so we can kind of, both for yourself and for myself and for the listeners, we can kind of imagine, okay, Saffron's at the frontier of these social, you know, so social technical systems, how tech is going to change society, um, and trying to just help, you know, a smart listener understand you know, we're kind of seeing this artificial intelligence crap. Um, and we're also seeing, but then how does collective intelligence relate to that? So that's kind of what we're going to get into today. But before we do that, Saffron, I'm just curious for you, like what, um, why you, like what, what got you down this rabbit hole of thinking about tech, but also society and then collective intelligence as well? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think I've been interested in this kind of intersection for a while. Um, I mean, I've always been very interested in both like the social sciences and the technical sciences um, and finding it kind of um, hard to pick um, which one I was more interested in as I was growing up. And so in college, I did both like applied math and I also did government, which is like a basically just like political science and political philosophy. And so I've sort of just like always been very interested in this kind of thing, but there's a lot of different ways to combine these things. It's like, you know, the words in a different, the same words in a different order lead you in very different directions. And so I just like have always kind of tried to like recombine these, like in, do like the interdisciplinary thing in a way that makes sense for me. Um, at DeepMind in particular, um, the first thing I worked on was multi-agent systems. So multi-agent reinforcement learning kind of um, on that team thinking about, okay, can we get AI agents to cooperate together in the way that humans cooperate? Or can we, um, you know, use these like more complex simulations in order to discover more about how humans behave together? Um, or um, how do we get like, AI and humans to like play well together um and so these like yeah all these kinds of like interesting questions um that I think I've just like been in various corners of for a while um and so I think collective intelligence is a kind of a natural interest for me like um actually the thing that made me really interested in multi-agent was this book that was on my manager's desk called the secret of our success um have you do you know this book yes i do it's a great book tell tell the readers about it or the listeners about it yeah it's um it's by joseph henrik who is like a human evolutionary biologist and he basically talks about how well the secret of the success of humanity is um cultural evolution and how like we've sort of our genetic evolution and our cultural evolution have kind of like occurred in tandem so that you know as it becomes more advantageous to have more culture and to be learning from people around us instead of storing everything that we can ever know or learn in our genes um we just like have this body of cultural knowledge that we build up and um our brains evolved to be bigger and to be more plastic and to be able to like pick that up and i was like this is the coolest thing ever and um, kind of like how do you know you know deep mind it's like how do we develop AI based on these ideas but I think um, generally being like wow cultural evolution is the thing that pushes has pushed humanity forwards and collective intelligence is kind of another way of talking about culture in a lot of ways so I think um, yeah when you frame things like that it's kind of like wow this is sort of the really powerful thing here and you know we can try and like advance it with AI or, um, you know, artificial intelligence, collective intelligence, like there's some interesting like parallels yeah. there. And so I think, um, yeah, it's like pretty under theorized in general, a very new field um, it, because collective intelligence is an academic field, but I think there's just like so much there that um, we haven't started. At least I, I, I feel like, you know, people could be paying much more attention to this kind of thing in, in general. Yeah. And that, that makes sense. It's kind of funny because like, yeah, interdisciplinary types. And, and I feel similarly myself. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited by humans, or whatever. But then I'm like, oh, man, let's learn about like, um, how like all this like green, green cement and green steel and all that stuff. And so it's like doing both and being able to be super sciencey, but also super human sciencey is fun. And then yeah, the secrets of success and, and weirdest people in the world and that once you start, once you see that, that's just a huge level up. You're like, oh, man, there's this cultural fabric that exists out there and our minds are consuming this cultural fabric and and one of the key rubicons of what you know the key things that we couldn't get um you know uh, key transition moments in human history was in uh 70 000 years ago a bunch of sapiens and and once you, the amount of cultural evolution kind of accumulated throughout a generation then it was like oh man now we're gaining more of this you know this cultural fabric than we lose and then that just kind of um, then we got all the things that we know today. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. that trying to like do a similar thing uh, and thinking kind of cultural fabric, collective intelligence. How do all these different agents interacting produce some kind of weird emergent behavior? That's uh, yeah, juicy intellectual stuff for for um, interdisciplinary folks like yourself. So let's talk about 
collective intelligence project then what um what is it and how did you all come to to start building it yeah totally um so the collective intelligence project or cip as we call it um because the name is long um is a incubator for new governance models for transformative for okay incubator for new governance models for transformative technology um so essentially we are focusing on the r d of collective intelligence capabilities, which are to us um, decision-making technologies and processes and institutions that expand a group's capacity to construct and cooperate towards shared goals. So that's like kind of a mouthful, but um, essentially, you know, like ways that we can create shared goals together um, or, or sort of ways of being um, and uh, kind of make them happen. And um, we are really interested in applying these kinds of things to, and by the way, like we think the, just to like make that more concrete, like what are collective intelligence capabilities? Um, I think some of the canonical examples that we have in today's world are like democracy is a CI process. Um, you know, um, markets are a CI process. Um, hierarchies are a CI process. It's like we've kind of, and all these things are constructed so that we can fulfill some kind of goal. You know, we need to allocate scarce resources. Cool. Let's make a market so that we can like achieve this goal in a collective way. Um, you know, we need to like, we need a governance structure that like executes on the people's will. Okay, cool. We like make, you know, versions of this thing we call democracy to do that. Um, you know, hierarchies have like various different goals, but they require, you know, like tight coordination. And so uh, people create organizations to do things. And so um, these are kinds of examples of them, but there's like lots of new ones that people are playing with, especially sort of like tech enabled ones, which I find very interesting. Um, but yeah, and then in terms of what we're trying to achieve in terms of developing uh, collective intelligence capabilities, we're just like really kind of focusing on um, ones that are relevant to transformative technology for now. So these are um, technological advances that can really alter our society. So, you know, we would put like, like the internet or birth control or, uh, you know, the printing press in this, in, the, in, in this bucket. And I think the current moments one is pretty obvious to everyone, or at least I think everybody's talking about it, which is generative AI or just like AI in general, which is also like handy because, I mean, I, I worked on it and I have a lot of context. And so I think it's like something that I have particular ability to influence. Um, but yeah, like people have compared, you know, ChatGPT or whatever to the printing press and who knows whether that is actually going to play out. But I think there is definitely good arguments for like, this is going to be extremely transformative and we should really think about um, how we can govern that well, because I think um, this kind of meme of like, wow, our uh, social technologies are so slow and creaky and, and you know, bureaucratic and, or like, you know, the, these are very slow, like that Edward O. Wilson quote about how you know, the one um, we even quote it in our white paper, but it's uh, yeah, the, the problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology. And so it's like, OK, can we get our medieval institutions to catch up to our godlike te technology, maybe even by using that technology or by sort of combining what we have in new and interesting ways? Um, and so I think that. Uh, technology itself is like a great motivating factor for doing this because we're like, wow, this is really speeding up. Um, and yeah, and then I guess, how did we come to making this? Um, so after I left DeepMind, um, well, Debbie and I have been talking about these kinds of things for a while since we got to know each other. Um, maybe I don't know how long ago maybe a year or two ago um and then after I left DeepMind and I was kind of like well I'm gonna go and explore things now um I immediately was like kind of Divya and I were both in New York over the summer and um we basically just came up with the idea of doing the collective intelligence project and um started thinking about what that would look like and so on and 
Um, I think we've been sort of like working on it much more full time and intensely in the last few months, but last, it sort of like started last summer and sort of like has, uh, I think actually like things have happened very quickly since then. Um, and in some ways it feels like it was a long time ago that we started working on it. Um, but yeah, so, so it's, it's that's, been, it's been really cool. I think. <laughs> that's great. It's a, it's an interesting, um, there's this kind of, idea of what I'm hearing is like, yeah, there's a, we have this technology that's intense. Um, yeah. I mean, that EO Wilson, Wilson quote is, is, is helpful because it's like, okay, the technology is intense. It is godlike and our institutions, they're not necessarily prepared, whether it's for climate change and to like really battle against, you know, like actually like not have 1.5 degree C of warming or only have 1.5 degree C. Um, and it's also not that good for stuff like artificial intelligence or all these new things that are kind of popping up where it's like, and as you know, I think it's smart to be like, okay, how can we use the tech just like uh, when the printing press was released, the governments themselves started to use the printing press as they were being shaped by it or whatever. And so um, mm. maybe let's get so so I, I I get that we're making these new we're trying to make these new institutions, these new collective um, uh, intelligence processes that like somehow surface goals and then surface values and then kind of act against them and use the technologies to act against them. Can you give a specific example of like what this might be? look like like what is this like an app or like you know what does yeah. this look like <laughs> yeah totally i mean i think because a lot of like collective intelligence is about information like i think a lot of these things can be digital essentially like digital tools um although i don't know i i wish that like yeah i, I wish i knew more about hardware and like did more like sort of physical things but fundamentally i'm just like a person who types on my computer um and so yeah so i i think it's like yeah like we can definitely use the internet and digital tools to improve our uh collective intelligence and one of the things that we are thinking a lot about is um like sort of machine learning augmented um deliberation and discussion tools. So um, one example of a really cool tool that you and your listeners may have heard of is Polis, um, which is this kind of tool that is created by the Computational Democracy Project. And they have been used in a lot of different settings over the last t almost 10 years, I think, to um, kind of have online fruitful online discussions about various like civic issues. So in Taiwan, they created a whole process incorporating polis um, to try and decide on issues like should, you know, how should Uber be regulated in Taiwan and bring all these different stakeholders in. And it's really clever sort of, you can think of it as a survey, but like a wiki survey. This is what Audrey Tang, who's like the digital minister of Taiwan says, but it's like a wiki survey in which like people, come up with your own statements or like questions to agree or disagree with. And so it's like, um, it's much more crowdsourced in terms of the topics that you're discussing than a normal survey. Um, and then it visualizes opinion clusters and, you know, which statements got more consensus, which ones uh, define certain like clusters of opinions, um, like we're, we're sort of group defining in a sense. And basically gives policymakers a much better understanding of what people actually think than a lot of other tools and it's just like fun and easy to use i think it's a like it's just like a very honestly like very simple but very clever thing and and it has been used to like pass regulation in lots of different places and just like do really cool things so that's that's like a kind of tool that we are using very excited about um and um, we also think that, you know, with like generative AI and large language models that this kind of thing can be augmented even further. So, for example, um, you know, looking at data visualizations can be pretty unintuitive for a bunch of like policymakers or decision makers. What if you had a um, kind of chat interface where you can talk with the results and like basically try and get a better um, kind of verbal understanding of what is going on in terms of opinion. You could even have it simulate a cluster of opinions and then talk to it about like, you know, this is like a simulated, uh, a simulation of like this group of users um, and you talk to it about like, 
you know, what the opinions of the users are. I think there's like problems with like anthropomorphizing and like all these things and misrepresentation and like definitely this is a thing you want to try in a lot of low stakes settings before you try them in a high stakes setting. But kind of like there's there's just so many ways that LLMs can be used to augment like democratic processes. I think just like it is really hard and difficult and um, resource intensive to gather input from the public these days. Like, it, you know, governments don't really have a lot of resource for doing the kind of like high fidelity uh, information collection processes that you might want. And so, you know, can these tools that make it much easier to aggregate qualitative data, the way that I think about it is they make it easier to aggregate qualitative data and not just quantitative data. So you can say like, what's the summary of these like five people's opinions? Or, you know, what is the crux of like these people's argument? Um, you know, what is the core of their argument essentially? Um, or how do I transform, you know, uh, this kind of viewpoint into a different viewpoint that other people from different cultures or political backgrounds can better understand? And And this is just kind of like, would be really amazing to speed that kind of thing up if we can do it in a safe way. So um, that is the kind of thing that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I love that. That's a great. Um, and is there is there a term? Sometimes I use the term consensus tech for these kinds of things. Is there a term that you use for this kind of like LLM? You know, taking a, an opinion group and then abstracting them into an LLM. Is there a term for what? What term do you use? Yeah, I mean, I like the term consensus tech. I I, I don't I don't really know that I use. A particular term um but i guess like the thing with consensus is that the um it might like misrepresent these tools as like trying to make everyone have the same view which is it's not really it's more like trying to create like maps of opinion or um i mean i think it's like a great idea to put people's put people in touch with each other and have them deliberate and you know people's ideas will change over time maybe not necessarily to a consensus but maybe there will be patches of consensus with them reaching equilibrium or something and um anyways so on the yeah, terminology yeah. No, but <laughs> yeah exactly no that makes sense so it's just like yeah i think there's you know a kind of strong consensus tech is something like blockchain technology where it's like no there yeah. is the blockchain that does whatever and then this is kind of a version this is mapping technology or this is um kind of empathy technology uh and then maybe getting to consensus technology or at least multipolar consensus whatever you know you know i call it technology where you're like great yeah. we're actually and I, and I think this frame for me is helpful when i think about um, and, and hopefully for those who are listening, it's like, you know, we've went, we've gone through this stage where we've kind of gotten to these hyper personalized, just like time spent, um, realities of just like tick tock, tick tock. Um, and then what we are now hoping for with this is to say, let's use this technology to, um, map the spaces, understand the clusters. Um, and then instead of, and I've, I've heard some other people talk about, uh, it where it's like, you have, um, Sam Alton was just talking about this actually, which is like the LLMs, um, you know, something like Twitter kind of collapsed nuance into 280 mm -hmm. characters. And then things like LLMs can kind of re-expand nuance. We're like, look, here's this person or here's this viewpoint or here's whatever. And so we're going to expand it into this um, more textured thing. And then and then by through that expansion and through this kind of mapping thing, we'll kind of, instead of just being in these hyper-personalized, you know, filter bubbles, whatever it may be, it's like we can start to build more consensus, build more understanding. And then so that, and maybe as a final note here, it's like, I kind of think of it like, you know, we live in this kind of pseudo hyperpolarized vitocracy where there's a lot of like no points in the system and people don't like to say yes to things. And it's like what consensus tech and what polis can do in some ways and what these other um, things that you're talking about, these LLM abstraction technologies, they can um, start to actually create more yes points. Where you're just like, look, you all are, we're all, you're all saying yes over here and you all want this thing too. And so it's like, great, let's like actually make that thing happen. And it's just like, and so we can actually start to build things as a society again, instead of just being like, you know, yelling at each other over Twitter or whatever. So mm -hmm. um, let me pause for a second. But is there, is that, is, yeah, are you, and, and are you starting to see some experiments with these LLM um, kind of representations happening or how, what's, what does the progress there look like? How are you all contributing to that? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so we are working. So um, right now, like the people who are full time on uh, the collective intelligence project are me and Divya, and we don't have a ton of capacity yet to build our yeah. own tech. But 
we are working with platforms. So for example, um, Narwhal, who um, they're like a sort of um, initiative from folks from the Emerson Collective and the Atlantic, and they um, are basically a startup that tries to create like um, healthy online discussion space. So um, they were like working with them and kind of, we're sort of like the future looking consultants there in a way where, you know, we like brought the idea of uh, integrating LLMs to them. And we've kind of been talking about various different ideas, but you know, that now in, in some of their discussions, actually all of their discussions, they have a like AI interpolator that summarizes the thread and they're looking for more ways of integrating LLMs too. So, I mean, um, there's, there's also, um, yeah, we're also seeing things happen in like with lots of people trying to experiment with things like this. Like I just feel like it's really, I think a lot of people are starting to see how exciting it is on uh, um, in terms of like collective intelligence. So actually Polis, um, Polis, Oh man, I don't know if I can. Well, when is this podcast gonna come out? <laughs> this podcast, good question. Uh, this podcast will come out in the in like roughly. Let me double check here. Um, I'm just like uh, man. What you're like yeah. You have some. You have some. Yeah, you have some hot things that are. Um, it's gonna come out on April twenty fourth. Okay, gotcha. So, I mean, okay. By this point, like this paper will probably be out. But um, let me just talk at like high level about. Yeah, you things. could. Yeah, you could keep keep it chill. Don't yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, it's just like, yeah, people are definitely playing with uh, LLM-enabled um, collective intelligence technologies. Let me, let me just say that. And I, and I think Colin from Polis in particular is, like, really excited about doing stuff like this and, like, has been working on stuff like this. So um, that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Cool. Um, so it sounds like, so it sounds like mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's in the water that there's a lot of uh, – and I think, I think the folks from um, – the AI Objectives Institute, the old Peter Eckersley thing. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think there might be things about similar stuff where it's like, okay, yeah. great, it's in the water. These, you know, LLMs can represent some. You know, we can we can start to get clusters. We can represent those clusters with you know these LLMs that then and those things can maybe help us and help policymakers and help um, individuals kind of come to more um, you know understanding or consensus as a people. So that makes some sense. Do you think um, are there other so like I guess there's that direction. Um, and maybe, but before asking about another direction, let's kind of zoom back out. You guys wrote this awesome white paper that was about like how we should, as a, as a um, species think about, you know, collective intelligence. And you had this good, like trilemma in there that helped me understand like where, um, yeah, kind of like the, 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 the balance of, of, of things. So could you explain like, what was this white paper and what was that trilemma within it? Yeah. Um, so the white paper was basically laying out the kind of guiding vision for CIP. And um, we kind of go through a bunch of things in there. One of the major aspects of the white paper is the transformative technology trilemma, which um, is basically um, mapping out these camps that we were seeing in the way that people would think about the future of technology development or how um, either how we should guide it or which direction it's going in. So the trilemma has kind of three points to it. Um, if you're imagining a triangle, there's participation, there's progress, and then there's safety. And we um, show that there's like multiple different camps, like three camps in particular, that have different, very different views of where we should fall in terms of prioritizing either one of, you know, progress, participation, or safety. And they usually assume, like, significant trade-offs between these things. Um, so progress being um, kind of technological progress primarily, or economic progress, so, like, advancing our capabilities in that sense. Participation being... Um, enabling public input and self-determination in the sense, we actually were thinking of calling it agency, but then we thought that might be kind of confusing. Um, and then the last one is safety, which is just like avoiding, avoiding really bad risks from technology. Um, and the three camps are um, capitalist acceleration, which is the people who 
um, prioritize progress, don't care much about safety, and are like kind of medium on participation. So that's like much more of the sort of like free market, like um, the like, utopian energy. Yeah. Yeah, the sort of like um, like accelerationist almost um, vibe of like, hey, we should just like charge forward as much as possible not regulate things and like we'll get to utopia, utopia real quick and like it'll be fine kind of deal um and then there was a sort of like the second camp um is what we call a like authoritarian technocracy um which tends to sacrifice um participation for safety um and maintain a sort of baseline level of progress so all these things are laid out in much more detail in the paper, but essentially um, this camp tends to really care about safety. And we've seen this a lot with like a lot of people, especially around in and around AI are really worried about like catastrophic and existential risks from AI. And um, I think they are, um, and not everybody in this camp, but some of these people tend towards this very like control heavy, view of things um and the and the thing that we talk about in as as the sort of like a bit caricatured example in the white paper is this vulnerable world hypo hypothesis from nick bostrom and where he's like well we just need to put like an ankle tag on everyone and do surveillance and like have comprehensive global surveillance and it's very 1984 like where you know we have to monitor everyone just in case somebody develops a really bad technology um, and also like preventative incarceration is fine um, and so I mean obviously this is kind of caricatured but like you know you can see those tendencies there and then you can also see those tendencies in like uh, some ways that certain governments have reacted to COVID which like a lot of people were like hey this is just like really kind of says it cares about safety but like trades off a lot of like kind of participatory input and like self-determination um, for that value. And then the last one is um, shared stagnation, which is people who really care about participation that sacrifice progress for it and um, are like medium on safety. So um, this is this last camp is um, kind of like people who are sort of like, okay, local decision making is really important. Um, participation is really important. Like we're going to really prioritize that in the way that we think about technology and the way that we think about like the economy or doing things in general. So um, kind of degrowth type stuff is like the most kind of obvious example of this sort of thing. Um, and, um, you know, we already have enough progress, we just need to redistribute it. Um, this kind of like view, which, you know, like honestly on a lot of fronts, I'm sort of like, yeah, like I, I get why you want to think in this way, um, but it does, I don't know, like at the end of the day, I do think that um, we need a level of technological advance that we're not getting. Like, you know, we need, there's a bunch of stuff we need to do to, um, in terms of climate change that are, so, there's a bunch of social stuff we need to do for climate change, but also a bunch of technological stuff in terms of a clean energy transition. Um, and then there's so many things that we need to do in terms of like, yeah, I don't know, like lots of things still cost a lot yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah so i'm kind of like man like i just like I, yeah like I, I just i think this misses out on a lot and also yeah. misses out on the it's unrealistic in a sense because the machinations of the world are still going forward they're still like you know multinational corporations and like huge like like things happening and like we need a sort of like approach that can uh, reckon with that in some yeah. sense, which I'm not getting from like the much smaller scale stuff. So anyway, so, you know, all of these camps have like different trade-offs and different views of what is most important. And just like putting that all together in one place and being like, okay, this is what we see. Um, we also think that these trade-offs are like really important decisions to make that shouldn't be assumed. And we should like put this all in the same place and look at it together and figure out what we care most about at what times and you know for who and in what context and so you know obviously like in some contexts we care much more about safety than other things and so i think um basically this idea of like hey like 
a lot of the times we take these trade-offs for granted um, and actually we just need, well, not just, but part of what we need is to have better ways of identifying these values, um, talking about them, uh, understanding what people want, and then um, kind of executing on those values. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, that was very long. But... No, I love that. No, exactly. No, that's yeah. great. It's like, and it's like, yeah, there's a, you, there, there's, yeah, there's the, the progress techno utopian accelerationist folks, you know, and then you have the, per, you know, the safety AI safety. Oh, everything's good. This is bad. Oh, we need to, you know, and it doesn't matter how much, um, uh, authoritarianism we use to present because we're preventing X risk. And so any, anything is worth it. And then the participation folks were like, well, there's just already way too much capitalism, way too much technology. And we need to like, go back to things. And we already have enough and just uh, like distribute it better. And so those are the kind of the groups. And, and as you said, we might have our own personal tendencies with those. I think I mostly agree with you, but it's also like what uh, some of the work that you guys do, the value elicitation work, the pull list work, the collective intelligence work, it kind of pulls out the texture of what people value when, and then to allow us to then make, um, uh, to kind of go forward given, given certain, uh, yeah, yeah. Values different times. So, so I have a, I have a question for you, which is like, we, so, and I think, yeah, a lot of your work, this collective intelligence work, the kind of, you know, um, you know, whatever, the mapping tech or consensus tech, whatever you want to call it. Um, so tell me about, so, so I guess from a very high level view, we have, you know, if we imagine society as the set of, um, is a little ant colony or whatever, a little collective intelligence ant colony. And, you know, we're giving out these little pheromones for each other that are showing things. And we have these little groups that kind of get together and organize, um, that's kind of the collective intelligence frame. And now we're getting this kind of new form of entity within our little ant colony, which is these LLMs, which are this new intelligence that we can kind of help and use to, to do things. What do you kind of see? What's like the long-term vision that you have for like, you know, 10 years or 20 years around like how, you know, if, in an optimal reality, how society would operate in a more collectively intelligent kind of ant colony way? Mm. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is maybe a slightly, like, meta answer, but I think um, it would be great if we had just, like, a much greater plurality of ways to operate, if that makes sense. Like, I think, you know, for people who want to start a company, um, this, like, LLC form, which has been, like, awesome and very useful, um, may be the best way of doing things, but it may not. And w it would be pretty cool if we just had, like, more uh corporate forms that were targeted at different kinds of outcomes um and you know there there are movements towards this like there's like b corp and there's you know um open ai is operating on a cap returns pol uh sort of framework but uh, i'm i'm very excited to see like what ends up happening with these kinds of experiments um things like focused research organizations which is also in sort of like new science like uh, organizational form kind of thing. I would love to see a bunch of these become like stable, commonly used, like kind of, uh, um, kind of, yeah, like forms that it's not just like a really niche thing, but anybody who wanted to start a thing that fit that thing knew about it and could reach for that. Um, I would also love to see, yeah, things like, you know, venture capital funding, for example, which is the the main way that we see tech funding happening um, in a lot of places where it's like the thing that all the entrepreneurs reach for these days, because what else is there? But, you know, venture capital has its like particular structures and its particular goals. And um, like, why don't we have different kinds of term sheets for like, why isn't, why is it not normal to have like a plurality of different types of term sheets um, such that, you know, like, any particular kind of term sheet was a minority, if that makes sense. Um, but to like these have these like stable, like it still have like, you know, four or five like stable categories of like things, but it would be really cool to just see more diversity in that so that people had more choice and also like everybody knew about what their choices were. Um, it would be really awesome to see this kind of like collective intelligence, like consensus tech, um, such as, you know, Polis or uh, the things that uh, AI objectives are building or um, kind of various discussion platforms, like having these be integrated into um, like institutions and the way that they like get public input on things. I'm thinking like in particular public institutions, but even like community organizations, like, you know, reaching for these kinds of like technologies as like a common thing would be 
and and regular thing would be quite cool um because i think there's a lot there in terms of like hey public institutions like you know in terms of like democratic theory the idea is that in a democracy the institutions are like executing on the will of the people but like how like they really have very little sense of what the will of the people is and so like trying to bring practice a little closer to theory would be awesome um and yeah <laughs> those are some of the yeah. things no i love that it's in, in the the overall frame oh and of course when, uh, like, I will, I, you know hopefully like you know we've like aligned ai or you know hopefully yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, also technology is going well <laughs> yeah. that's funny no but I, I think it's and i think it's a you know um it, i think that that form the you know, new that that we have all these new institutional vehicles out there that are actually stable, you know, things where it's like, look, we don't necessarily, um, you know, this, uh, you know, these focused research organizations that should exist. Not all science funding should be done this way. Some of it should be done in a five year, fifty million dollar thing, and you build this platform that turns into GPS or the um, Human Genome Project or whatever that helps everybody. Um, and then term sheets, yeah, it would be amazing. It's so crazy that. Um, okay, I'm looking to build technology, blah, blah, blah. Okay, where should I get money? Well, I can either do this like very small grant funding, maybe I can get a million up to 10 million bucks, you know, or I can get like a $5 million, you know, you know, thing from VCs and whatever. And then, but, but the outcomes, it's all black swanny stuff. You've got to do black swanny stuff. And there's no, the incentivization yeah. for protocols and shared interoperability and all that. It just doesn't. And so we have this, uh, a bad ecosystem from bad incentives. Um, and then finally on the last one, it's like, yeah, it would be great if, um, our, at the governmental, so the first one's like, you know, like science is like fro stuff. And then there's like um, companies and new kinds of companies with different incentives. And then finally, the um, new kind, the government should um, be updated. The government, yeah, the will of the people. It was kind of okay when we did will of the people in, you know, 1776 or whatever, when it actually meant, oh, sorry, no women and, you know, no black folks. And the, you know, black folks can only count for three and a half. So we, it's really just like a core set of whatever that just like do it. But now we're actually trying to do a good job of this. And so it's like, let's actually do the thing instead of just like being um, dysfunctional. Okay, great. So that is a beautiful future that I hope will also occur is institutional um, acceleration, institutional improvement. Um, I want to ask a question as we get into rap mode here of like, what advice do you have for um there's folks like you and me who are in the world and they're like oh i like sciencey stuff but i also like people or i like tech but i also like society do you have what advice do you have for an ambitious interdisciplinary young person oh man um i think i'm still figuring this out for myself honestly so huge grain of salt here but i think it's important to build strong foundations in something and i think um, even if the strong foundation is in like some particular interdisciplinary thing, like, you know, don't like always be like, don't flit around like five or six different fields, like, you know, build, like build your specific foundation in economics or in, you know, machine learning or in like the specific intersection of like machine learning and economics. Um, and like all the ways that those two fields overlap and try to get a really good sense of that. I think into I, like I think interdisciplinary work is super important, but it's also really important to have like a really good sense of what it means to be deep in something. And I think like it's really easy to sidestep that. Um, even if it's like I don't know, just like do something like a thousand times. I don't know, like, uh, like I think I think it's just like good to be rigorous about these kinds of things um, and maybe like try hard to not just follow the crowd because um, I think it's like the perfect time to explore when you're young and it's just like gets harder to do this later on. I think it's like really easy, especially I think tech is like a really trend-driven place in a lot of, ways and like I find this really hard but like yeah try to like make sure that you genuinely really think this thing is like interesting or important for yourself and like you uh you are like 100% comfortable with like how you justify that to yourself I think yeah yeah cool yeah so two big pieces are one and I super agree with the first one just like you actually have to get 
you know, in 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 um, Peter uh, uh, Peter, what's his last name? Peter from Ryan Peter Reinhardt from Segment um, slash Charm Industrial is like the frontier is closer than you think, you know. And so it's like, but you have to actually get there, you know. You can't just like be an interdisciplinary person who's like, I kind of know a little bit about things. Like, no, like touch the frontier, and then you can go on to something else if you want. But like, know a thing, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then um, the other piece is yeah, to like yeah, if, if you're excited by something, yeah, 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 d- d- yeah go from self-excitement um as you know allow the world to do its things but like self-excitement is a crucial um piece of the ball game okay what is um what is one book you know when you're just talking about secrets of success which is obviously a banger what is another one book you'd recommend that others might not i would recommend god human animal machine by megan O'Geeblin. have you heard of this book uh let me i'm i'm looking it up now uh, tell us about it yeah so um Oh my god, I love this book. Um, it's a collection of essays by um, this author who actually used to be like extremely Christian, was raised like fundamentalist Christian and went to Bible school, um, you know, as college and dropped out of that and kind of has, it's just like deeply insightful in a bunch of ways. And, you know, she'll talk about like Ray Kurzweil and uh, kind of transhumanism and like panpsychism and but also it, it, it's just like a really wonderful look into technology and meaning and kind of religion and 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 I, I was I found it striking how much kind of religious overlap there like how much sort of religious ideas and metaphors overlap with like the sort of technological ideas and metaphors that we deploy today um and it's just like great writing she's a great writer um so I don't even amazing know amazing i just i had i had not heard of it and i just added to my want to read on goodreads so god human animal machine thank you that sounds like a great yeah it's kind of it reminds me of um yeah there's kind of like uh anarch not a uh, cyber feminism kind of 2000s energy but this one is written in 2021 and so it's like kind of a modern what I see is maybe like a modern take of like, okay, how do we think about all this random crap with technology, but um, in a kind of super interdisciplinary way. So that that sounds great. Um, and then let me ask you, let's do a quick little overrated, underrated. So I'm going to name a thing and then you'll say whether it's overrated or underrated and then like a one sentence on why. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, LLMs uh, and like ChatGPT, is that overrated or underrated? Oh, man. <laughs> I think it's like both. Um... I think it's overrated for, I think a lot of applications, oh man, okay, I'm going to offend, I think, I think whatever I say, I'm going to offend people. But... Yeah, you're screwed, you're screwed, you know? <laughs> <I'm> yeah. screwed. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's both. I think it's like underrated in certain ways and overrated in a lot of other ways. Um, and I think I also, in particular, I think that like, there's certain things like replica type things. And I don't know, there's just like a lot of things that people are excited about that I'm like, I do not think and I think there's having worked on making LLMs like I think the people at OpenAI are amazing but there's so much unknown about this and so to to rush into like being like well you know like my LLM app is going to like teach kids all around the world and like instead of you know having a tutor or whatever it's like that's like we should be like really careful about these kinds of ambitions um anyways run over <laughs> yeah no that's great that's great tldr you think the uh incels on replica who are using replica as a um a weird did you hear about that the weird people that are like using replica as like a sex they're like the little like a date like their lover or whatever <laughs> they yeah, got turned I mean, off you know i read i read like an amazing um piece about people on replica and honestly i'm like I, you know, do not think that I would be above necessarily, like, you know, falling in love with, like, a replica AI or something yeah. like that. Like, I'm yeah. like, hey, humans are, like, humans are complicated and come with a lot of feelings and traumas and, like, yeah. I don't know, this piece is, like, just great in terms of, like, wow, some people are, like, positively using replica to deal with their traumas or, like, some people are, like, I don't know. It's just so complicated. Like this is making them super dependent or whatever. You can yeah. draw all sorts of like judgments from it, but I think it's just like extremely dicey territory in oh, general. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Oh, and I yeah. think people are like 
was weirdly super excited about like building this. I'm like, I would never want to be responsible for that. But anyways. <laughs> Intense. There's a lot of, um, it's like, it's easy when the LLMs just do, when you're like, hey, I have this little thing that helps me with my Excel spreadsheet. But when it's like, oh, when this this thing, it's like my therapist, it's like a little bit more intense. Um, okay, so let me ask one of the overrated, underrated, which is, um, what about this, like the frame of collective intelligence saying like, oh, let's think about the collective intelligence here. Collective, is that overrated or underrated? I think it's underrated, obviously. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I would say that. <laughs> and, and why? Uh, why is it underrated? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just think, I think like, I mean, we talked about AI and CI a bit. Like, I think people, um, if, I think in general in our culture, we valorize like individual intelligence and kind of artificial intelligence and AGI as a goal. And I think it can be kind of detrimental in, in certain ways. And um, I think thinking about collective intelligence makes it more obvious that like intelligence is much more complicated than like IQ tests or um, yeah, like I think I think the full spectrum of what like intelligence can be is like better understood when you think about collective intelligence, I think. And I also just think that like fewer people, way fewer people are working on like collective intelligence type applications. Although I think it's growing. Um, yeah, fewer people are working on it than than like other kinds. Yep, that's and I, I like that, which is like partially a for trying to understand artificial intelligence. One way to understand new intelligences is by looking at another intelligence that's literally right here, right now, which is co our collective intelligence. And then the other one is like, yeah, that um, uh, day we're just anything that we're so over indexed on ourselves and like the egoistic frame or whatever. So it's like, <laughs> no, there's like not just IQ tests, not just this atomistic reality, but this more general one. Um, beautiful. Well, with that, thank you so much for coming on Saffron. If you want to check out um, Saffron on Twitter, um, it's S A. It's just her name on Twitter. So S-A-F-F-R-O-N and then H-U-A-N-G on Twitter. And then also, if you want to check out the Collective Intelligence Project, a.k.a. CIP, you can go to CIP.org. Uh, with that, Saffron, anything else you want to say to our listeners? Um, no, thank you so much for listening to me talk for an hour. <laughs> It was great. No, it was good. And, and, and thank you guys for doing, there's a juicy um, space here around, yeah, consensus mapping empathy technology. And I'm excited to see uh, where y'all take it in the next kind of uh, decade. Um, so yeah. thank you so much, Saffron. And thank you listeners for listening. Goodbye. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, and see you here for the next episode. Bye.